so let's get our bearings here. Um, you know what, Ellen? Uh, we can go on the record. Uh, let me get my file. I know, I know you've been through uh, a couple of portions of your sections. Um, but I wouldn't mind giving the dysfunction, dis, not dysfunction, dysfunction, uh, <laughs> uh, whatever it is. Uh, if you could start from the beginning, but do the stuff you did very quickly already, and then we'll get to more detail on the stuff that you haven't done. Sure. Okay? So and if you could give, just give me two minutes, I'm trying to move from storage to Well, why don't you direct us to where your sections start? Did you start right the first section? Yes. Okay. One through 11. Yes. Right? We only made it through one through four, though. Okay, well, let's do those again, but we'll do them with the understanding that we have talked about them before. Okay, we're on the record. Thank you. Ellen Tchaikovsky, Office of Legislative Counsel. I'm here at S237. So when last we spoke, I walked you through the language starting on page one, sections one through four, and they have to do with a proposal related to municipal planning for uh, inclusionary growth and uh, increased de uh, density of development. Right. So uh, the first section in the municipal plan, First, it requires the addition of um, water and sewer lines, facility and service areas to be added to the municipal plan. Uh, then- How would that make it easier to develop? <laughs> I don't know if that is specifically aimed at making it easier to develop other than knowing specifically where the water and sewer connections are specifically. Okay. So, um, next, uh, there's changes to, in section two, the, the municipal bylaws section, uh, 4412. This is adding, um, uh, requirement that if a municipality allows multi-unit or multi-family dwellings, they must allow at least four units. Uh, so that's setting. They can they can prohibit more than four, but it's setting the baseline that they have. To, if they're allowing multi dwelling multi unit dwellings, there has to be at least four. So currently, a bylaw could allow for duplexes, but nothing more. Yes. And now, if they right. allow for duplexes, they would have to let, allow for quadplexes. Yes. And that goes to our density. Um, the next section adds that uh, the requirement that if a, a single family dwelling units with an accessory dwelling unit uh, are subject to the same review requirements as a single family dwelling. And then it changes the definition of accessory dwelling. Sorry, that's still in section two. Yes. Okay, it's just a that's different. Hard. It's just, uh, I'm, I'm on hard. page three. Okay, okay great. Because sorry, I, I thought you would skip to section three, but no, okay. you're on page three. Yep. Right. So I take that to mean, in general, that presently there can be separate requirements above and beyond what is required for a single-family dwelling, and. Uh, if you have an accessory dwelling unit. And now it's going to say for accessory dwelling units, it would be the same as if it was a single family in terms of setbacks. And yes. It's okay. And it has that wonderful word on line 11. And a big change here is the 30% rule is being eliminated. Yes. So right. you can have because we had heard one comment in one of our meetings that um, generally in state law, the accessory dwelling had to be the 
sort of the minority partner in the house and said, why, why can't we flip that so that right. the elderly person can move into the accessory dwelling? And this would take care of that by because it has no percentage figure. Yes. Right. So that the 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 major the property owner could be in the accessory and right now. thought of as an accessory now. The yeah. It doesn't need to be clearly subordinate to right. the original. Okay. Right. And we also in this section I'll remind us at the top of page four, get rid of the parking requirements, which we we need right. to address in some capacity, obviously. We're but gonna have a whole morning on it we to use this later this week. Right. A bunch of experts. So, yeah. Um, what does the sub subsection uh, little 2i do on page 4? Bylaw. Bylaw that's less restrictive? It just that says you can't, nothing shall be construed to prohibit bylaws that regulate short-term of oh, short-term rentals. Yep, so okay. this is the, the language giving power to regulate short-term rentals uh, distinctly from residential rental units. Right, but in the same breath, we're taking away the ability of towns to do conditional use review on accessory structures. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So this is adding it in if we want municipalities to regulate uh, short-term rentals. You need to give them the, the power to do that. And that's what this does. Uh, yes, although there may need to be further. So we're taking action. away and giving back at the same time. Yes. Watch the object. Senator Bell, we're on page four. Bottom of page four on S237. Okay, so we're actually at the top of page five now. And this is for the grandfathered lots, section two, the yep. part two. The small lots, so a municipality can't prohibit a lot less than one eighth of an acre uh, unless it is not served by or able to connect to municipal water and sewer. So if they are able to connect, you can't prohibit development on that small lot. Which in a city, an eighth of an acre might be a good <coughs> Uh, I, I assume this is showing my lack of expertise in this area, but I assume that um, a town doesn't necessarily have to, you have a, by right the ability to connect to a municipal sewer. If it's there, you have the right to connect. They can't get around this new change here by just saying, we're not going to allow you or we're going to charge you an exorbitant fee or... I, I don't know specifically. Uh, yeah. We'll save it for when you come up later, okay? Okay, let's flag it, because uh, Chris can answer some of these maybe then, right. as we go through. Because otherwise we have to remember. Yeah, I have no to ask him. Okay. Good. Okay, so then start, starting with sub B, inclusionary growth. So this is setting up a, uh, an opt-out system where the municipalities are required to adopt these inclusionary growth bylaws that allow uh, greater density and infill unless they demonstrate with a municipal constraint report that they have too many constraints already and, can, and do not want to allow the increased density requirement. So the default is you have the increased density and if you can show that there's unique problems in your town or area, then you can opt out. Yes. Okay. And how do you opt out? You go to the department and ask for... Yeah, the department at the end is supposed to provide a sort of a form and guidance on what the, the report has to look like, but the, the municipality has to uh, submit a report on the constraints that the town is under so that they wouldn't be able to um, support, be able to support the increased density. Okay. And do we raise that for towns that are just being NIMBYs? Do we raise that? So towns, some towns have, have nurtured their constraints so that they don't have to deal with increased density or people they, you know, or 
So there. So towns. Right. Yep. I see that. So what the the sort of catch-all is at the end, the department is supposed to come back to you and to this committee and describe uh, the number of towns that have opted out and what the actual constraints they listed as. So there isn't necessarily a uh, a way for the for the town to be denied their opt out. But there is a, at the end, the department will report back on how many towns didn't want to do increased density and what their justification was. So um, then potentially in the future, you could look at that issue. Okay. I'm a little unclear on, on the, the effect of this. What we're doing is we're saying here in, say, paragraph C on page six that. Uh, a town can't have a requirement for a single unit dwelling, is that correct? Uh, so that is... And you're saying that it, it, you, know, you can't prohibit a t uh, approval of a two-unit dwelling in any regulatory district for which the, when there's water and sewer there, that, is, a, that is, is sufficient to serve two units. Is that what we're saying throughout this, you know, for any? Uh, that, yeah, requiring conditional use. So that's um, <coughs> a layer of review on top of the, so um, conditional re, uh, use has certain requirements that you have to. Could, could you put in English that if we're putting this in a newspaper, <laughs> telling people what this bill does, what does this bill do or, or with respect section. to what is single it, unit dwellings? What does it do to confidence? And, well, and, we'll get to that. That's the yeah. next section. But, but, but just what is it we're trying to do here with this bill in, in this section? Is confusing. And That's a fair statement. <laughs> well, I'm, well, I'm not I, to I don't think so. I think we're trying to increase density where it makes sense and uh, encourage towns as much as possible to develop in their core centers where they may have sewer and water. And if they do have sewer and water, we're enabling them to go a couple steps further in their ability to uh, create more housing opportunities. Well, the question is what's the constraint? on a municipality that this bill and these sections impose? It, it lifts restraints. Constraints. Constraints, does it? And my understanding is that uh, Chris could answer. Well, I, you know, well, Chris will get into that. This is obviously this is Well, to me, it's just as we're reading and going through a bill, trying to understand what's in it, I don't understand this. Exactly. So it's important that when we get a presentation, uh, at least certainly the first presentation, we get the gist of what the intent is here as opposed to the specific language. Because uh, the, the language, we can, you know, it can be read back to us, we can read it, but we still don't understand it, so it doesn't really help to read it. So we need to understand the basic thing, but I think what I understand it is you may have a municipal water or sewer system, but it may not be able to accommodate more growth. Right. It may be at capacity. So then you write in and say, you know, you're trying to lift this so we can do more, but we don't have, we really don't have the capacity. So if you, uh, well, that, that I can understand. That, so that's, but what, does, what I, it's, it's the contrary where I'm having difficulty. Okay. Is what, if I'm reading this correctly, what it's saying is that if you have this water and sewer capacity, you can't prohibit. Right the development of a more dense unit. And is that what we're imposing on municipalities? And uh, I'm just, yeah, I, I, I think just it, have a, yes. yeah, but sir, we're, trying yeah, increase, yeah. we're trying to increase density to make right. whether they want it or not. Right. Well, yes, exactly. But what, they what, have the opportunity in this. That's what we've been chatting about. Is they have the opportunity to defend their constraints and 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 talk about why they can't well, add When you say to defend their constraint, and maybe we're, maybe we're getting ahead of ourselves right now, do they have the ability to voice their dissent, or they yes. have the ability to simply say, no, we don't want to do that, period? So there's going to be a judge. Who's the judge? The judge, I guess, is the department. You're giving them a waiver. The department? Or the agency. Yeah. I mean, that, this is a first draft. Agreed. You, might not, you might not like the Ask the, I'm not the liking judge. what I'm hearing so far. Well, look at it this, <laughs> look at it this way. I mean, we passed a law 
20 years ago on accessory dwelling units. Mm -hmm. And the league fought us tooth and nail, mm -hmm. and we established it. Now we're probably going to go the next step and make it even greater. They may f fight us again, and we may have a different mm -hmm. decision whether we want to do it, but we're trying to promote affordable housing. So there are policies in this bill that are going to increase density in places where Sports some people, towns, might not like that increase. But we have to make that decision if it's important enough for us to do it this way or another way. I don't, you know, I don't think there's probably anybody on this committee that doesn't want to improve the uh, access to affordable housing. Whether this is the right way to do it or another way, no. that determines. That could be a debate. That's the debate, right? Right. So but, and you can ask yeah. the department when the department comes up. Well, again, uh, what I'm trying to do, though, as we're going through this walkthrough, is just understand what we're walking through right. and what but it is that this is purporting yeah. or, or attempting to do. Exactly. And okay. I want to reemphasize. That's where I see a lack of clarity. I, I want to reemphasize my putting this bill in mm -hmm. with other people was just to get the discussion going because I'm not sure I agree with everything that's in this bill. Okay. Right. But we're. I'm understanding it that this is part of the ability to enable greater density where it's appropriate and where it's wanted. And there are also parts of this that say that the municipality can opt out of it if they have right. certain restrictions. Which is what well, he's saying. They have the absolute right to opt out, and it's going to be at well, the discretion of someone overlooking their. Is it because what Ellen said was if they do it, there's. They're coming back with a report saying, you know, how many of them have done it, but there's nothing saying that they won't be able to opt out. It's right. my understanding. I don't know that that's what the bill says right now. We haven't now. gotten to so that part yet. Let's keep going. Okay. So, so, yes, this is setting a, a baseline of <coughs> unless you, you opt out by submitting the report, the municipality cannot prohibit one either one quarter acre if there's water or one eighth acre uh, lots if there's water and sewer. Right. Okay, so I will break from my rule and ask Chris just this one question. Is, to, does the, does a town, just by making the request, have an absolute right to opt out of these things? Yeah, we're not, the, the intent behind this was to have a conversation around housing and to allow communities to opt out they come up with a reason. It was a. It was viewed as a soft level of compliance. We're going to put your name down on a list, and we're going to see how this works. If it doesn't work in five years, we'll see the list of communities who opted out. Right. Who okay. participate. Okay. So they yes. have an absolute right to opt out, whether they're exaggerating or not. And they can lie to us if they'd like to. Okay. Yes. All right. All right. That's Does this have enough. a potential perverse effect of discouraging <laughs> the extension of water and sewer? <laughs> Uh, let's, let's wait for Chris to come up because we can go all around a lot on this one issue. But I'm glad we got that clarification. Okay. Okay. Um, D. We're on D on page six. Um, and then so D is the requirement related to the parking, the minimum parking. Um, this is a, allowing that if um, towns have a minimum requirement for parking per unit, that if the spaces will be leased separately from the dwelling unit, then they can be count, counted as double uh, to meet their <coughs> parking minimum. This is hopefully encouraging creative parking solutions. And then on page, so then on page seven, we get into the, the opt out with the report that we just discussed. So the municipality submits this report to the department. Um, the, the department is supposed to provide a template and guidance on what the report should look like. Um, the department is also required to um, post the reports on their website, as well as provide copies to. Um, the Regional Planning Commission, Directors of Municipal Water and Sewer, Vermont Community Development Board, Downtown Development Board, Housing and Conservation Board, and Natural Resources Board. Um, on to page eight, um, a municipality that's filed a, a, restraint, a constraint report must uh, update the report every time they update their plan or bylaws. 
and then uh, down on <coughs> 11, we start the incent incentives and funding related to this. So there is increased incentives for the towns that don't opt out, that do uh, participate in the inclusionary uh, growth. So on uh, on page nine, so those towns that have stayed in and haven't opted out uh, will get priority. There will be priority funding for those towns for uh, municipal and water, municipal water and sewer systems, municipal planning grants, Vermont community development program grants, and the neighborhood development area tax credit program. So that's the carrot. Yes. And uh, there's also a provision that uh, when, we, when a municipality has adopted the bylaws to comply with the inclusionary growth, uh, they may adopt bylaws to allow land development that has been restricted by covenants, conditions, and restrictions that conflict with this. Um, so they can override restrictive covenants. And then section three lays out the language that allows them to override restrictive covenants. And these are not in environment conservation covenants. These are only sort of. As the language is now, it's all um, covenants and restricted deeds, so it may need to be redrafted. Yes, yeah, we'll have to because everyone wants lots of lovely green space in their downtowns, too. Um, does this envision uh, subsection B talks about prioritizing funding? Does this um, take away funding from other elements of these programs? Do you know? Or is that a question for the agency? And is there going to be new money suggested for these new functions? Uh, I think it's envisioned to just prioritize. Give, it gives the extra carrot for those towns that have complied with the inclusionary growth. Um, I don't know specifically if it, will, if it will end up taking away money from others, but those who have complied with this receive priority in their funding. Okay. And then section four on page 10 is the report back to the General Assembly on the towns that have opted out by submitting a substantial constraint report. And so the department will report back on the number of municipalities uh, and what kinds of constraints and any steps the department um, recommends. Yeah. Sorry, I thought we'd started on covenants. Oh, I, that was, okay. that's the whole language. If Oh, I see, but here's the report on the top, top, page 10. Got it. Sorry. And that's where we had ended before. Okay, thank you. So section move on. Okay, so section five starts with the Act 250 related <coughs> section of this bill. So this, the next few sections are all related to exempting downtown development districts and neighborhood development areas from Act 250. So it starts with um, the definition section here in section five. So line 11, 10 VSA 6, 7, and 1 <coughs> is amended to read. So this is the definition section of Act 250. And we're amending the definition of priority housing project. And Basically, we're exempting the reference to designated downtowns. Um, so, a priority housing project <coughs> is a discrete project located on a single tract or multiple contiguous tract of land that consists exclusively of mixed income housing or mixed use or any combination thereof and is located entirely within a designated new town center or designated road center under 24 VSA Chapter 76A. So what, are, what, what, do, what did we do last year or the year before? We did some exemption to Act 250 for uh, some sort of 
housing based upon the number of units or something? So priority housing projects under Act 250 are exempt up to a certain size. So, uh, and that a priority housing project is related to where it is located. So this is changing it so that it's only a, a project located within a new town center or a designated growth center. Um, Uh, I don't, I wasn't here a few years ago. I think you, so priority housing projects in. Yeah. Uh, Chris, could you answer Okay, quickly. Yeah, um, we um, changed the, the definition of what um, um, types of projects qualify as priority. So we adjusted the income requirements on the priority housing. You adjusted what? Adjusted the income requirements okay. to um, 80 to 120%. To give it an exemption plan 250. Right. And now we're going further in terms of right. exempting different geographic areas. And we're saying downtowns yeah. and neighborhoods, you know, right. all Regardless. development, commercial housing is not a subject to Act 250. Whereas the other one was just targeted. Okay. At, to the 80 to 120. And certain mixed unit, mixed income projects for mixed <coughs> use development. So just uh, while we're on mixed income. Mixed income, does it have a definition or is mixed income? Yes, everything It defined. does. <laughs> so mixed income is defined. So sadly, and that's up to like what? A 150? 80, 80 to 120. It's still okay. quite low. Um, that's, I, I don't yeah, know okay. <laughs> no, but I mean, it wouldn't, okay. I will get to that. And that was in what, 17? Or 18. Three years ago, maybe. Maybe when we did it with the bond. Did we do it with the bond still? I think well, we I did. Here. I don't remember what Jen's here. Show. Did we change that definition with the bond, bonding bill with the bond, or was it the year before? Jen Holland of the HCB, I believe, and Chris confirmed that this were, these were adjustments made when you um, created the neighborhood development area um, designation. And that was size two neighborhoods. I, I believe it was part of that package. The bonding package. No, there were changes a couple. Yeah, I'm just trying to remember when we did it because it was reasonably recently. Three years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry, Ellen. Um, right. So we're in the next section. I'm going. We're going to exempt downtown, downtowns and neighborhood development areas, so they don't need to be included in priority housing projects. That, that definition. Right. So. Uh, on to page 11. So 10 VSA 6081 is amended. This is the exemption section of Act 250. Um, subsection P that I'm going to get to in a second is where the exemption for downtowns and neighborhood developments area is, but this is section O is the sort of fallback. So it's a little backwards, but you'll, it'll become more clear. If a designation pursuant to 24 VSA Chapter 76A is removed, subsection A of this section shall require, uh, shall apply to any subsequent <coughs> substantial change to a development or subdivision that was originally exempt pursuant to subdivision 6001-3A-4I of this title or subsection P of this section on the basis of that designation. So if a town loses its designation, either a downtown designation or a new town designate, a neighborhood center or any of the other um, designations, um, development in those areas will require a permit, even if they were originally exempt. So if they're- Further development. Yes, material change, if there's a material change. So if a project goes up and it doesn't have an Act 250 permit, and the town loses its designation, um, but there's a substantial change to the project, they will need to get an Act 250 permit. Okay. Uh, subdivision P1, no permit or permit amendment is required for any subdivision development or change to a project that is located entirely within a downtown development district designated pursuant to 24 BSA 2793 or a neighborhood development area designated pursuant to 24 VSA 2793E. 
Upon receiving notice and a copy of the permit issued by an appropriate municipal panel, pursuant to 24 BSA 4460F, a previously issued permit for a development or subdivision located in a downtown development area or a new, new neighborhood is extinguished. What does that mean? It means, so currently, uh, all Act 250 permits exist for in perpetuity. They are forever. And so this is setting up a new concept where if you are in a area, a downtown, a downtown development area or a new town, or a neighborhood development area, you can have your Act 250 permit extinguished. You could have it end because you are under the jurisdiction of the municipality. But wouldn't you like to be doubly protected? Keep your Act 250 permit forever and be exempted from I mean, why does it matter if you're going forward, if you're prospectively looking at development? Isn't everything that's in place just fine? Why wouldn't you just keep it rather than going, bothering with ex extinguishing it? Well, it would be inconsistent with what we're trying to do here. Would it? I thought it would be if you're, just further supportive. No, if you're under Act 250 and, a, and you're, you're changing a project that's now within a downtown district, why should you be treated any differently than a new project coming along? Oh, I'm just assuming the project was finished and that you had an act. You said your Act 250 permit is forever. So the project can be finished and still have had an Act 250 permit, right? Yeah. So why extinguish it if the project's finished? I mean, I understand that if a project isn't finished. Sometimes you change the project going forward. Okay. So I think. let's keep going. So. Don't mean it the last. Um, so on page 12, uh, all of uh, a subsection is repealed because it references a section we're about to repeal, section 6086B. So we're striking that language. And then section 7 is the repeal. <coughs> so section 7 repeals. Uh, section 6083A D, which is the neighborhood development area fees, which uh, uh, because we're exempting neighborhood development areas from right. Act 50, we're, we're shrinking that section, as well as 6086B, which sets up the downtown development um, area findings and conclusions, which is currently a process under Act 250 where, d where development can be exempt in downtowns if they go through this findings and conclusions process. So uh, we're, we're repealing that also because it's a full automatic exemption. So now section eight, this is going to set up the process by which uh, municipalities grant permits for projects in downtowns and neighborhood development areas and then can extinguish the Act 250 permit. So 24 VSA 4460 is amended, appropriate municipal panels. This subsection shall apply to a subdivision or development that was previ previously permitted pursuant to 10 VSA chapter 151, that's Act 250, is located in a development in a downtown development district or neighborhood development area designated. Does it, does does A need to be tweaked at all? Because I can read that two ways. I assume you're talking about perspective right. uh, projects. It should, I guess what I'm saying should say would have previously been permitted under? No, because this is going to lay out the process by which they extinguish the permit. So this isn't related to um, the prospective exemption of developments. This is going to this have them exempt. Uh, this is going to extinguish the permits they already have existing. Okay. Or the ones that they were in the, in the process of building. Or the permits. Yeah. This goes to the these are existing project. These are existing subdivisions and developments that were previously got an Act 250 permit. Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. So have a previously permitted is located in a downtown development district or neighborhood development area designated pursuant to Chapter 76A of this title and has applied for a permit or permit amendment 
required by zoning regulations or bylaws adopted pursuant to this subchapter. <coughs> the appropriate municipal panel reviewing a municipal permit or permit amendment pursuant to this subsection shall include conditions contained within a permit previously issued pursuant to 10 BSA Chapter 51 unless the panel determines that the permit conditions pertain to any of the following. So this is saying that when they issue a new permit, they should adopt, they shall adopt the permit conditions that were in the original permit unless the following are true. Can I just ask, yes. with regard to what Senator Clarkson asked about permitting that was in process, is that addressed in C? Is that the 250 permits that you're talking about? Yep, so this has to do with extinguishing, yeah, I'm, switching over. Yeah, okay, so anybody who is in the middle of an Act 250 permitting process now, it's that's extinct. going to be extinguished and going, going forward. So that project will now come under the new regulations. Yes, they will be exempt from Act 250, but have to comply with the municipal and they'll also have to comply with whatever requirements were in the Act 250 permit that they were applying. Yes. So what I'm going to suggest um, going forward, just so we're on, hopefully we're all on the same page, and it's subject to discussion here, is that some of the stuff on Act 250 and environmental stuff is probably more appropriate for the Natural Resources Committee. But what I want this committee to do is to understand what is going on here in general and give our blessings to say we want to achieve that goal. Right. And then we'll send it down there for them to do the fine, you know, the fine, uh, right. define it. And, um, and what I would like the, we're sort of doing this now, but what I would like either, and you guys could work together, but I'd like to see an annotated version of these sections describing in lay language what it's attempted to, attempting to do and giving maybe some examples. Write side by side in smaller print, put a comment in there so we can follow that and understand what's going on. Because this is outside of our area of expertise in terms of that. We produced that document. Having said that, let's move on. Sure. So, um, so the conditions will be transferred to the new permit unless it's one of the following types of conditions. The construction phase of the project that has already been constructed, compliance with another state permit that has independent jurisdiction, up at page 14, federal or state law that is no longer in effect or applicable, an issue that is addressed by municipal regulation and the project will meet the municipal standards, or physical or use condition that is no longer in effect or applicable and that will no longer be in effect or applicable once the new project is approved. After issuing or amending a permit containing conditions pursuant to this subsection, the appropriate municipal panel shall provide notice and a copy of the permit to the Natural Resources Board. The appropriate municipal panel's determinations shall be made following notice and hearing as provided in 4464A1 of this title and those persons requiring notice pursuant to 10 BSA 6084B. The notice shall explicitly reference the existing Act 250 permit. The appropriate municipal panel's decision shall be issued in accord with section 4464B of this title and shall include specific findings with respect to its determination pursuant to the subdivision 2 of this subsection F. Any final action by the appropriate municipal panel affecting a condition of a permit previously issued under issued pursuant to 10 BSA chapter 151 shall be recorded in the municipal unit record. Okay, so next, uh, section nine amends the downtown designation. designation. Uh, so on page 15, it strikes the reference 
in the section to Act 250. So re the requirement that there's an, a development review board to undertake the local Act 250 review um, because they will be exempt from that review now. Okay. Section 10 uh, makes changes to 24 BSA 2793E, which is the neighborhood development areas. So this section includes changes both in respect to Act 250, but it also includes references to the earlier inclusionary growth right. uh, changes. So the first change is on the bottom of page 16. So these are the requirements for when a neighborhood, uh, for when a municipality is applying for a neighborhood development area. These are the requirements they have to demonstrate. So starting on line 17, the proposed neighborhood development area consists of those portions of the neighborhood planning area that are appropriate for new and infill housing, excluding undeveloped flood hazard and fluvial erosion areas. In determining what areas are most suitable for new and infill housing, the municipality shall balance local goals for future land use and availability of land for housing within the neighborhood planning area and the smart growth principles. Based on those considerations, the municipality shall select an area for neighborhood development area designation that. Wait, wait a second. So sure. what, what is that? What does that change? Changing identifies or develop. Uh, so only areas in flood hazard areas that are undeveloped are going to be exempt from the neighborhood development area, meaning that already developed areas in the flood hazard area are part of the neighborhood development area. Sadly. Part of our challenge is how much has been developed in flood hazard areas. Um, so uh, a selected area for neighborhood development area designation that avoids or minimizes to the extent feasible the inclusion of important natural resources as defined in subdivision 2791, 14 of this title. If an important natural resource is included within a proposed neighborhood development area, the applicant shall identify the resource, explain why the resource was included, describe any anticipated disturbance to such resource, and describe why the disturbance cannot be avoided or minimized. If the neighborhood development area includes flood hazard areas or river corridors, the local bylaws must contain provisions deemed adequate by the Agency of Natural Resources to ensure that, the, that new infill development within an existing settlement occurs outside the floodway New, de new development is elevated or floodproofed at least two feet above base flood elevation or otherwise reasonably safe from flooding and will not exacerbate flu fluvial erosion hazards within the river corridor. Good. Definition for reasonably safe from flooding. <sighs> no. So yes, that may need to be addressed if it's not clear. Uh, the next change is on page 18. So we're, we're still in the requirements of what a municipality must show for a neighborhood development area. So line nine, within the neighborhood development area, the municipal bylaws allow as of right minimum lot sizes of one quarter of an acre or less and minimum net residential densities greater than or equal to four single family detached dwelling units per acre, exclusive of accessory dwelling units, or no fewer than the average existing density of the surrounding neighborhood, whichever is greater. So this relates back to the early uh, inclusionary growth uh, system established. Um, the next change is on page 19, um, it strikes the reference to Act 250, uh, the requirement for the Act two, for the district coordinator, um, and then the next change starts on line seven. Local bylaws, regulations, and policies applicable to neighborhood development area substantially conform with neighborhood design guidelines 
developed by the department pursuant to section 2792 of this title. These policies shall ensure that all investments contribute to a built environment that enhances the existing neighborhood character and supports pedestrian use, ensure sufficient residential uses and building heights, minimize the required setbacks, parking requirements, and street width, and require conformance with complete street principles described under 19 BZA 309 D, street and pedestrian connectivity, and street trees. So this is to get uh, approved as a, um, a neighborhood uh, uh, yeah, neighborhood development neighbor, area. Yep. A neighborhood development area that's exempt from Act 250. Yep. Right? Yep. So are we, which way are we going in these changes on B and C? Are we making it easier? Yes. Um, it actually is just to, because the inclusionary growth principles in the earlier sections require um, density, they don't have to be explicitly referenced. So that's why it's a slight change. They don't have to demonstrate the density requirements They are that's already accounted for in the requirements earlier. Okay, I'm not sure. So I'm not sure it's making it easier or Okay, shorter. what about lot sizes? Quarter of a quarter. Because you, you're specifying the lot sizes now, you don't have to make any reference here to lot sizes because yes. okay which would minimize the required lot sizes that was so on back on 18 i think it uh on lines nine well, we'll hear from the department yeah it just seems like it's going in the opposite direction but it may be i don't try to I think so, I think. Well, now you're having, it used to be, a, to get this designation, you had to minimize so that, required lot sizes. Now you don't have to do that anymore. Right, because you've begun to take care of it in uh, section saying. seven. Yeah. Anyway, so maybe. Uh, let's hear from Chris. Yeah. Okay. All right, the next change isn't until pay, the bottom of page 22. So we can skip. Starting on line 19, page 22, neighborhood development area incentives for developers. Once a municipality has a designated neighborhood development area or has a Vermont neighborhood designation pursuant to section 2793D of this title, a proposed development within that area shall be eligible for each of the benefits listed in this subsection, provided that the project meets the density requirements set forth in subdivision C7 of this section, as determined by the administrative officer as defined in 24 BSA chapter 117. These so basically, this is just changing who's, who's controlling that. Yes. Yep. Oh, yeah, because there's a reference to Act 250 in there, too. So, yep. Just Right. These benefits are the application fee limit for wastewater applications stated in 3 BSA 2822 J4D, the exclusion of the land gains tax provided by 22 BSA 10002 P. <coughs> so it's striking the Act 250 fee incentive. Um, the next change, starting at the bottom of, uh, on line 20, uh, Chris, I'm sorry. Sure, what? Yeah. Line 11 and 10 11, what is that getting rid of? That's the fee for what? The Act 250. So they, uh, currently, under Act 250, neighborhood development areas have a they have 50% discount on their fees under Act 250. And so, because they're going to be exempt now, it's a straight, it's straight. It's just they get rid of all the okay. fees. Yep. So, uh, starting on line 19, alternative design. <coughs> If a municipality has completed all of the planning and assessment steps of this section but has not requested designation of a neighborhood development area, an owner of land within a neighborhood <coughs> planning area may apply to the state board for a neighborhood development area designation status for a portion of the land within the neighborhood planning area. The applicant shall have the responsibility of 
to demonstrate that all of the requirements for a neighborhood development area designation have been satisfied, and to notify the municipality that the applicant is seeking designation. The State Board shall provide the municipality with at least 14 days prior notice, written notice of the Board's meeting to consider the application, and the municipality shall submit to the State Board the municipality's response, if any, to the application before or during that meeting. On approval of a neighborhood development area designation under this subsection, the applicant shall be eligible for the benefits granted to the neighborhood development area subject to approval by the administrative officer as provided in subsection F of this section. So again, we're striking the reference to the district coordinator, which is part of the Act 250 process, and making it the administrative officer. Okay. So then the la this is my last section, section 11. So this is a change to the Vermont Downtown and Village Center Tax Credit Program. So we're in the, we're in the definition section of that program. So, so it just, oh, it just sure. allows the credits to go to neighborhood development areas? Right, yes, that's okay. the main for us. Good. Uh, so here and same from. thing is on page 26. Yes. All through that. All through that. Yep. Okay. And then Thank we you. go to the bond. The bond. And we're going to have Rebecca Becky's on that. Thank you. Thank very you, much. Alice. Anybody have any questions? We'll have plenty as we go. Okay. And I think Chris will help us. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's good. Oh, sure. You need to leave over. <laughs> sections from the previous bond right and how it was done sure. today um so becky wants to know legislative council um so th these sections were actually based off of last year's bond language um which had taken some money from changes in the property transfer tax um, I think that's $4 million to pay for the new bond. So I think that's a great way to start in that since it was placeholder language just taking from last year, some of the numbers are not correct and um, some of the information and cost references need to be updated. Okay. Um, it was really just taking that structure from last right. year and, and putting it in the bill. So you say $4 million, is that to adjust to get to a $50 million bond versus a 30 <laughs> I think, I think last year totally it was it was for fifty million. Well, so there are there are two. There was the bond from twenty seventeen, okay, that's what I said. and then um, the proposed bond from last year, okay. and then there were changes in the property transfer tax that went into effect last year. And I think the estimate from that was that it would be an additional four million in revenue. Um, I don't know how that has played out, so I think there might be a need for another analysis. Okay. Um, and so the idea was taking the additional revenue from that tax change and putting it towards the new bond. So I think when looking at this language, we it, it doesn't have an amount of the bond, and it, it needs an analysis of how much revenue from the property transfer taxes it would need to support it. Would need. it right. um, and in the intent section in section 12, um, there are references to the 2017 bond that were um, updated as of last year, but um, were not need to be updated, I think. They definitely need to be updated given how many more housing units we've yes. built with it. Exciting. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, this was just, that was at that point in time. Right, right. Had done 550. But we can happily update that. Okay. Um, so can you walk us through, uh, I think it will be useful if you can, walk us through the bond that passed in two years ago and implemented to follow the money. 
sure. know, where I was um, raised and approximately how much and then where the money went and how um, I mean it went to it went I think through VHFA to the VHEB to yeah, the developers. I'm just, I'm just trying to see where the language I think um, isn't it so I don't I don't have lack I don't have that bond okay. language with me but I think I can show on page Beginning on 29, um, right? Yeah, on page 15. 29 and section 15. Um, this is the, the property transfer tax. So if you turn to page 30, um, subsection D, starting on line 12, um, it says that prior to any distribution of the property transfer tax revenue under, um, and it lists a, a few statutory sections, 2.5 million of the revenue received from the property transfer, ta transfer tax shall be transferred to VHFA to pay the principal of an interest due on the bonds that um, is authorized by VHFA, um, the proceeds of which would go to um, VHCB for that first bond. So VHFA would be um, issuing the bond and the proceeds would go to VHCB to pay for it. And just jumping around here, what is the uh, line 20 through line 3 on the next page? Why is that being deleted? Uh, so that was for the first bond, saying that the, the rate, I believe, for the property transfer tax right. had to stay a certain amount in order to raise $12 million to, um, for the first bond. But that needed to be struck out because um, for the second bond, <coughs> you needed to raise more than just $12 million. So um, you'll see that change reflected on page 31 in on line 12 in the new subsection F. I it's see. it's okay. saying um, you, need, you need to make sure that the rate of the tax doesn't reduce revenues. Um, right. And it has, again, sort of the the 30 million um, and 18 million based on what last year's estimates were for the bonds. So I think those those are examples of numbers that would need to be updated. But this is basically saying you need to make sure that the the tax rate brings in a certain amount of revenues right. to sustain those bonds. Is any language in section 13 different than what we passed out? This committee last year? Um, uh, no, <coughs> section 13 is the same as it was in last year's proposed language. It's basically giving um, the HCB the authority to use the proceeds from the bond issued by BHFA and I'll say the second bond. Um, to, for the purposes of um, meeting community needs. And this committee had set forth some priorities um, that start on the bottom of the page. So this is a, exactly the same language that was from last year. Okay. Is there anything in here that's essentially not the same <coughs> as we passed out of this committee last year? Wasn't there some, did, did we inject in this concept here the possibility of a series of bonds or was that oh, passed by last yeah. year? Yeah, so in the intent section, Yes, on, yeah, on page 28, um, line lines three. one through five, it says that it's the intent of the General Assembly for the VHFA to issue a new bond or a series of bonds between a um, certain time period over a five-year period. Um, so that is different than? Yeah, it, it didn't say that. Um, okay, is there anything else that you could highlight for us that could be different from what we discussed last year? I guess I would just highlight again that the numbers need to be updated and when the bond 
tax rate needs to be updated and then the bond would need to be paid off would need to be looked at in terms of if it's a series of bonds over a five-year period i think that implicates when it's paid off right. um, which is not something that was in last year's language and you know truthfully is not really in here so i think that needs to be thought about a little bit more right is um i don't know if you can answer this but is a series of bonds really nothing Let's say we were to do a $50 million bond in one fell swoop. Is a series of, and you wanted to do like $10 million, $10 million per year, is it essentially the same bond in smaller tranches, as they say, for five years running? Or is it, does it become one issuance, or you just make a decision every year of whether you're going to go forward? Um. HFA would be better place to answer that, how, how what would need to be done. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Okay. Thank um, you. Oh, you have anything else? I do want to mention one other thing, which is not bond-related, but is new to this section, or to my sections, on page 34, section 20. Um, yes. There was some TIP language that was added in here as well. So in Title 24, um, there's a list of all the municipalities that have been uh, have received a, an approved TIF district, and uh, that list um, does not include Bennington and Montpelier currently in statute, even though they have approved TIF districts. So this language on page 35, lines 10 and 11, are adding those two right. towns. So that's just clean up? Yeah, that's I mean, just nothing substantive. Yeah, it I mean exists, just, it's nothing substantive, it's just if you're going to have a list of right. the districts that have been approved in statute, it, it would it needs to be updated um, when new districts are approved. Okay. And if I may in section 21, I had asked that, and this happened just as we, in the flurry of the deadline, I had asked that Tucker's language that he had drafted for me, actually not for Jim Harrison, be put in this, and it somehow didn't make it. So I would also hope that as we consider section 21, we consider some additional STR. Who would be the drafter on that? Tucker. Tucker drafted it for me. And he, um, sorry, I'm short. Remember? Yes, on short term rentals. That's not David. <coughs> I don't know, actually. So David or Tucker? David, it was, a, it was a disconnect between Tucker okay. and David. Okay, thank the you. The whole office will be involved. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> but what I'm gathering, the whole office is involved with that. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Chris, I'm going to give you. Three minutes. You're so generous. You'll come back. But if no. you want to, if you want to correct all the mistakes I've made so far, you can do that very quickly. Uh, or hit, I'm there. Or hit the highlights. But we do have to go to a caucus. Yeah. So um, we just know how much you can accomplish in such a short time. And probably not a whole lot. Um, things I can clarify. There were some questions about why are the water and wastewater systems being mapped. Just because a community has capacity doesn't mean the capacity is universally available across the community. And it's you know, 2020, That's and we do not have GIS information on where the pipes are, where the capacity is, and where their location are. Okay. We need that information to be able to identify opportunities to infill your capacity. So Montpelier might say we can take gallons and gallons, but only here, here, and here. We don't have that information, so that's why we asked right. for that information. You had some questions about uh, technical corrections to the neighborhood development area program. They don't, they aren't germane to the changes proposed in 117 about one quarter acre and one half acre. They're related to clarifying what the minimum base um, four units per acre requirement is. Many communities would say, oh, we have a planned unit development or we get these density bonuses. We didn't want that. We want to say, look, we want it to be clear in your bylaws that you enable four units, one units per acre. And that was the intent of those corrections. There's no relationship to the 117 language. And then on the 117 line, just as a reminder, you know, the administration developed that, um, but we backed away from that. Um, they, the governor, governor's office.
office wants an incentive-based program right. to provide training and education and tools to allow communities to take these steps if they want to. The 117 language in there now says you have to. You have this. to. Right. And so the House bill actually reflects that change. <coughs> right. right. And there are several uh, things that are in the House bill that, you know, to enable the tax credits, um, additional changes need to be made in um, Title 32 into the tax sections to um, increase the cap and enable the, the, the where the benefits are enabled in multiple locations. And there's lots of pieces that are missing in your draft bill that would need to be added in. And in two hours, we'll find out how much the cap is being increased by? You will. Okay. Yeah. It's not going down, right? Can't even say that? In two hours. Uh, <laughs> have I'll patience. Your real. answer is have patience, yes. Chair. Um, but, um, and then for our next steps, so I know you want an annotated bill. We have those pieces, and be, we'd be happy to work with Ellen um, okay. to get those. Um, but I don't know how to get these other sections into your bill, because we haven't really had a conversation of uh, other sections. Um, increasing the credits um, um, in the in Marcotte's bill, there is the um, VHIP program, Vermont, mm -hmm. right. that grant program. Right. I don't know if you want that in or out of right. your bill. Well, we've taken it out for now. Yeah. But we've okay. talked about that better places, crowd granting incentive right. program. No, we've that's taken that not, out. Yeah, that's okay. not in there. Um, and there's provisions that enable municipalities <laughs> to permit water and wastewater connections that is not in your bill, that is in Marcotte's bill. Okay. Um, this is broadly. How did, I, I know when we drafted the bill, we took out the two sections about VHIP and crowdsourcing, whatever, but that how, did, how, did, how did the other get not get in? I, I can't explain that. I don't know. Okay. Because um, I, I would like to have that in here, yeah. so it would be. Okay. Um, and then there's an additional provision for opportunity zones. It's a capital right. rights exemption. Uh, we Say that again. Uh, uh, capital gains exemption. You're a low voice in my hearing. I'm it's sorry. a bad combination. <laughs> Uh, capital gains, um, there's a proposal to exempt capital gains within opportunity zones, and this is a program aimed at homeowners. Um, we saw um, that in finance, I think. I don't think it's been public. We just talked about it in this no. committee no. when we just we did our initial one through of those kind of one pagers. Um, oh, maybe that's where it's We've on. got language for it, um, and if you want to support it, um, right. you know, it'd be a good incentive. The benefit here is most of our credits are enabling rental housing right. property improvements, right. Right. wherein this would help homeowners. Right. homeowners. Why don't you send, I see the other two, why don't you send the opportunity zone and, and, the, wastewater. The, and the wastewater to the whole committee and to I guess David Hall is okay. in the lead on this, so send it to him and he'll give it to the appropriate attorney. And, and okay. the corrections to enable the tax credits, I assume you yes. want those. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then the other thing we wanted from you was the lay language. He uh, said he was going to do that. Yeah. 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 yeah, I'm just saying it out loud. Okay. All right. That was more than three minutes. I'm sorry. No, you did well. <laughs> Thank you very much.